Well, welcome, Rob. Uh, I'm glad to get you on. Um, is one of our next uh, L6 and L7 uh, announcements as we go around. Um, so, so let's start it out with uh, congratulations. No, no small task. Um, you know, our, our top 100 ERISA guys that we kind of put through the program uh, had to do both back to back. Um, had to deal with our, our L6 kind of design one and then straight into the lab with the L7. So you guys had to actually do it a little bit harder than everybody else. Most people probably, you know, take a year between the two things. Um, so just wanted to get on and kind of talk about it a little bit. Um, say congratulations. We're going to post this around, let, let people see that, uh, you know, real people are actually going through the program. Um, you know, we're, we're working on it. We're, we're real engineers. This is what we do for a living. And, and we're, we're giving it a shot and, and giving the world a little bit of feedback on it. So. Uh, why don't you start by introducing yourself a little bit about where you come from, what your career path's been, you know, open mic. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Terry, for that. And thanks for putting on this great program you know, with the ACE certification programs that we have here at Arista Training. Um, I'm, I'm Rob Martin. I've been here at Arista for over five years now. And like a lot of us have many roles, I'm MNSE, so I lead on the pre-sales team of helping solve technical solutions networking wise for customers to ensure a great network for them. I also lead a team of post sales AS engineers. And then also on the side, you know, what I help do to help benefit ERISA and our customers is I run what we call ERISA test drives. It's our platform to generate labs and get ERISA out in front of our customers and everyone in the field, you know, hands-on time with a virtual ERISA lab free of charge for them so they can help learn what Arista has to offer with that. That's kind of what I do here at Arista. Um, my journey didn't start, you know, right away in networking with Arista. You know, going back when I was younger, trying to figure out what I want to do with my career, I always gravitated towards design, architecture, and actually have a career, had a degree in practice in landscape arch architecture for many years, and just found out it wasn't my calling. And you know, I've always gravitated toward, you know, the quote unquote IT world and networking just really fascinated me. So I was able to start off at a local school district as a network engineer, you know, learning the basics of networking, advancing, and then why to, you know, go beyond, you know, experience more. So working at some larger private companies like Redbox or insurance auto auctions to where I get the more scale of a geographically diverse company and you know, larger networking responsibilities. And it wasn't until my time at Redbox is when I was first introduced to Arista. I remember, you know, hearing the name the first time and I was, you know, taken back to still knew the industry at the time, but never heard of Arista. But I was in charge of running the first, you know, migration onto Arista from the incumbent vendor that they had there and um, switches. But, you know, for the moment I powered, we powered on the chassis and I started working on the CLI, and, you know, I fell in love with the platforms. Um, the biggest thing that appealed to me was the automation extensibility. I love scripting and Python and whatever language you want to throw it at me. Um, that's what really appealed to me. And from that moment, it's like, I'm sold. You know, I want to work with Arista where I'm at. And I was lucky enough to be able to come on board and, you know, be able to experience it every day and also help our customers, you know, work with Arista and EOS and everything we do have to offer. No, it's it's great. I know what you mean, dude. I've like I did uh, the customer side. I've, I've worked with you know our largest competitors, you know, from from a vendor side and different things there. And it's um, it's it's refreshing. We're a young company, so so we we got growing pains like everybody else that that's you know this age. Um, so there's there's it's interesting time to be an employee in a young company like this. You know, we're not quite a startup anymore, and we're not quite an old dinosaur yet either we're somewhere in between and, and that makes it interesting but um hands down the the group of engineers here um i mean from our software engineers all the way out to our SEs, as your ps everybody in between like um I, I have never been around such a great group of super smart guys you know all in one place um so that's really refreshing to me and yes it's uh i did the same thing when i first got here uh, you know, first thing I want to do is play with the boxes. Let's see what this is. Let's see what it's really about. I've, I've been through the marketing for years and years, maybe help put some of it out there, but you know, what, where's the, the rubber meet the road? Does this stuff work? And man, it's such a cool thing to really, really believe in the products that we have. Cause, cause they work. 
you know, we can get more people to see them. Um, we'll have more people to use them. I, I think it's very, it's surprising how many times we put this stuff in front of our customers and, you know, they're like, you're our boringest vendor. We have no problems with you. You know, why do we pay you maintenance? Like what, nothing breaks. You know, it's, these, these are really cool things that, that you get to hear working here. And, um, I mean, that even comes down to what we were talking about, what you did with, with ATDs and, you know, what we've done with training and how we've done the labs, the, the idea that we can take and virtualize this code. And it's not like some weird, you know, I can remember vendors in the past where you get a virtual instance of the code and it's like, okay, well, I can type the command, but nothing works. You know, this is not working or it's so cumbersome. You know, it's, it's great that we have very, very few features that we can turn on and test at a high level. So it's, we literally can duplicate your network and work on it and automate it. And you can take those configs and dump them over and import them and off you go. Like this, this is actually a strategy we give people, which is, you know, foreign in a lot of ways, but uh, I mean, just to, to highlight on that a little bit, cause um, you know, when we go into ATDs and what we're doing, the same thing with our training labs and stuff like this, um, this is not a super easy thing. We're not just turning on a box. We're, we're not just pushing on. We have multiple backend systems, lots of programming, lots of uh, automation that's happening. Um, if people could see behind the scenes and see, you know, our Git, you know, GitLab stuff and, the, you know, the repositories we have in GitHub and the scripts that are going on in the background, um, it's extremely complex from that point of view. Um, and yet we do this so we can dynamically spin these things up, spin them down. I mean, give it on any given week. How many, how many sessions, lab sessions do you think you guys have active in ATD? We probably have at least a good two to 500 each week. I would feel like around the whole company globally that are running consistently. And like you said, dynamically, just, you know, they go, we've got the, you know, the same experience for every user. Doesn't matter if they're first time or been through it many times, just want to get a refresher. It's, you know, what they expect out of it is the high quality from everything we do here at Arista. Yep. So tell me a little bit about, uh, what, how'd you get into Arista? How'd that work? Were you at Redbox when you came over or was that the, the last hop or had, it's always interesting. It wasn't the last hop. It was almost, um, yeah, I fell in love with Arista while I was at Redbox, like I mentioned it. Um, I, I had an interest, like, I just love to work with this on a day in and day out basis. And I've never been on the vendor side and, and I looked to, I went transitioned to another company and had opportunity to come over, but it didn't quite work out at that time, just timing and everything. And so, you know, I continue honing in further my networking skills, having diversity based on backgrounds in the network field, uh, cause no matter where you're at, everyone does network differently and how they, you know, look at things with it. So it just gave me more background expertise, knowledge with that. And, you know, the opportunity came back up again, where, you know, there's a position we start off on the advanced services team. So post sales work, helping our customers when they, you know, want to deploy a risk of being that technical expert in the field to help them out. And so that's where I was able to get my start here at Arista and, you know, the freedom I love here is being able to, if there's a passion to be able to follow what you want to do to help give back to the company and the customers. And so with my natural interest in scripting and automation, I was able to, you know, as we said before, advance the Arista test drivers that we have and, you know, be able to grow there from, you know, being on the, the pre-sale side of the SE to help create technical solutions for our customers. Yeah, that's always the the kind of the internal joke, right? Is like, what's your job? I'm like, which one? The one I'm paid for, or yeah. the other seven? <laughs> yeah, we we all we which you know it's kind of cool. They they are hobbies, I guess you could say in some ways, or pet projects or things like this. But something is big and and you know, frankly, extremely important to our sales process and our customers getting to know us and actually being able to try us out instead of just trust whatever we're saying. Like, it's a huge tool and. Fundamentally, that tool was built off of, I think we could do this. And then we go sit on the side and we start playing with it. And now now it's a critical part of the, the company and what we're doing. And, and we do this everywhere. It's that that constant software development mentality that, that even those of us that aren't technically software engineers or software developers, we still enjoy being able to kind of do that. I know I've done the same thing on the training side. So um, did you... 
what was your certification journey like before before you got to Arista, before for doing any of this? Where did you have a lot of them? None of them? Like never thought it was worthwhile. What, what's the story there? Yeah, so I never had a a big focus early on. Like early on, trying to transition to networking and getting into there. You know, since I did come up and have a formal education in computer science or networking, I was trying to find ways to prove myself. You know, if it's trying to get sure, make sure I got certifications. Uh, I started going down the journey of it and then I didn't finish it. I was just trying to be okay. I wanted to focus more on technical, practical knowledge. You know, I like the mentality of trying to do it and prove that I can do it than having exams say, yes, I can do it um, without actually being in the real world scenario of doing it, what those tasks are, what they're out to accomplish for with those exams. So it was never really a big focus on me the whole time. Um, because I was always trying to think like, wow, what's, how's that exam going to differentiate me and make me feel better and be able to be more producing in the field for whatever role I'm at, wherever I'm at itself. So, so kind of little, little to no certifications previously. And that's, that's fair. You know, I mean, if, if you think back to most of us that have been around this world for, you know, 30 years or more, um, you know, people coming in today, they assume, you know, CCIE has been there forever. It's just, you, how do you get into networking and not know what a CCIE is? Like, it's it's just the, the facto. And and some of us remember when it wasn't there and how the initial group of people that came along, it was, you know, we we built we built a credential around this skill set. And the people that already had that skill set could just walk in and, and improve themselves. And you know, we kept some of that same logic here. You know, I like to say I was, it was very revolutionary by going old school. You know, it's, we didn't want an exam. We didn't want to make a business out of exams. We wanted to give our customers a way to validate, you know, an engineer skill. Um, it was something that pressed on me really hard when I started here, you know, five years ago was to sit down with some customers. And I think customers were seeing, you know, this group of people that had kind of collected from all different areas. Um, very high end talent that that's all coming together. And, you know, it's a pretty common thing for us to walk into a customer. We go do something brilliant. Um, customers are already kind of blown away that they ask a question and we weren't looking up in the catalog to see what page the product was on. We might actually look at them and go, we don't, we don't have that today, but we could solve that by doing X, Y, Z. And I'll help you build that. And customers are like, what? Uh, normally our vendors say, well, we don't sell that. So sorry, move on next subject. Um, so we we're able to roll down our sleeves, roll up our sleeves and actually get, get dirty with it. So that the natural question that the customers will have is how, how do I, how do I hire Rob? Well, okay, well you can, you can't steal him from us. We need Rob. Well, how do I build Rob? And that's, you know, combined with, you know, Mr. Duda popping out. And that was my first challenge. I've said this a couple of times in the video. So, um, on some of these interviews is, that was maybe my big trigger when I got here was hearing Ken turn around and go, I love when smart people use our stuff. I love seeing what they can do. And I go, okay, well, I, I'm, I'm going to own the training department now going forward. So I guess my charter is to go try to make smart people. And, you know, and what is that definition? And, you know, we, I started out by looking at uh, some of you guys. And, and you can remember this. We reached out and I talked to a lot of you. What do you think we need to train? What do you think those core skill sets are? What does that look like? Um, so we had those questions that were very customer centric, but then I said, you know, are what, how do we're going to tier the levels from level one to level seven and in level seven, if that's going to be our lead guys, this should be the same skill set that our lead guys have here. So who are our best SEs? Who are our best AS guys? What is their skill set level? And let's make that the de facto. So now we can answer to the customer and say, you, you want to rob, you need to go hire somebody that's an L7. And that's a good representation of you're going to get a version of Rob. You know, might not get his personality and work ethic and all that, but at least you'll have the same skill set when it comes to EVPN, MPLS, and, you know, Ansible and things along that nature. So um, what did you think of us doing uh, design and then doing the practical? See, now that you didn't, you haven't kind of come through the expert world before, was that weird? Did that make sense to you? Yeah, it did. It was, it was a nice way to go through the exams. Because it really kind of mimics a, you know, a day to day or 
you know, what I experienced at Arista and how I work with our customers of, you know, going through a, des a design phase, you know, every network is different. You know, what are those, what are the challenges? What are they trying to address? And so thinking of it that way, trying to think of, you know, how we can use these open standard protocols and for interoperability and consistency that we have across our portfolio and software, you know, to design a solution that fits, you know, our customer needs and, you know, being part of the, you know, as you quote, how do we get a mini ro uh, clone of Rob with it? It's going into, you know, the design thought, how do we get there? And then, you know, transitioning on to the, you know, the implementation phase of a UI, I'll call it, but doing through the, you know, the three different, the three lab scenarios for the three different exams for the, you know, to make up the last part of it, you know, it goes into what we do to, you know, get the network deployed, you know, you know, doing it over multiple days. It's, you know, that's what you would do in the real world and how we would do it. You know, we're not expected to go deploy everything, you know, all these different sites in a matter of a couple hours, you know, at least the building of it. Yes, we can deploy easily and quickly with, you know, automation, but you want to take your time with it. You want to make sure you're catching yourself. And so what had really attracted me to this whole process was how much it does mimic, you know, our day-to-day, -day. you know, from the design phase of it to implementation of configuring it, deploying it is, you know, I can leverage tools that I would do if it's Ansible using automation with Cloud Vision Studios or if I want to, I can still get on the CLI and do what I need to do. You now, because with, you know, the virtual topology that we have, it's just like we're working with a, a regular Arista switch. And so everything is still there. There's no guardrails on the device itself to where, you know, I can investigate if something isn't coming up right. So that's what really attracted me towards this was how much it does replicate my day to day, you know, to be at that level, you know, of Arista and networking itself. So, so this has always been a big one for, for years in the industry is, you know, if you're studying for some of the other expert programs out there, um, you know, it's how do you go about studying for it? And, and typically, you know, I've coached a lot of people in a lot of our competitors programs in the past. And, you know, typically I would say, listen, you got to go down to mainstream. That's going to make up, you know, maybe 60% of what's on the exam. So you need to know stuff that's in the, the, the courses that are below it. Um, but then you you still got about 40% that's you may not find in a course anywhere. You know, that's stuff you need to go out and look. And or let's say that that's 30. Then you got 10% that it is so far off the wall, you might not even ever see this unless you're a tech engineer for three years at Cisco, you know, or three years at Juniper, whatever. These are these off the wall things that, yes, there are customers that run into those scenarios, but they, they, they're not a, a, an everyday thing. They're, they're a necessity that somebody had to keep in their network because they couldn't get a way around it. Um, so, you know, quite often you'd run into these scenarios where it's very hard to prep for this stuff because it's kind of like a, a, a mystery. Um, I've even seen these vendors turn around and say that we're, we're not going to produce a course for this expert track. We think people should just know it. Um, what kind of trickery did you see in our stuff? Just from an engineer point of view, forget that you're wearing a Rista shirt right now. Did you feel like there was stuff that was on there that you wouldn't see in just about any customer that you've walked into since you've been an SE here? No, I didn't see any any man behind the curtain hiding stuff from me or trying to trick me or fumble me up. It's, you know, because what comes down to it's, you know, I want to do what's important to me and in the networking, what I'm going to see. So I appreciate that where it's nothing that's, completely hidden or off the wall that I'm not really going to see that if I am hitting, running into that situation, I'm going to be doing more research ahead of time, you know, trying to understand that beforehand instead of kind of being blindsided by it. Um, yeah, you know, the link difference is really, it's, you know, a matter of opinions with network design, you know, what underlay protocol to use, what kind of core protocol you use. And so, you know, that's the only thing that's always up for debate and opinionated, but it, it's things that you're expecting to see, you know, the kind of open standards with it, whatever you want to do that. If you understand how those protocols work, you'll be able to understand how to get it configured and, you know, troubleshoot if things aren't working properly. 
and that, and you know, that's, that's, I really love the way you kind of described that. Cause that was, that was our intent was, you know, when you come into L6, we're going to get, give you a design scenario. We, we mapped those off of, you know, a couple hundred RFPs that we went through that are real RFPs. And we look for common things that were there. And so we created our, our, you know, our test RFPs, if you would, um, as, as a collection of real stuff, just not tied to any one particular customer for obvious reasons. Um, but we don't, we don't necessarily dictate what you do for underlay. What, what we grade you on is what questions did you ask us? How did you get to where you, you got? And why did you choose the underlay that you chose? You know, um, I've known ISIS for, for years and years and years. I'm comfortable with it. Uh, it it's a no brainer in a lot of ways, Un unless the team that is going to be supporting this after I go to sleep doesn't know ISIS, then I would have been better off putting another protocol there. And, and to me, that's, that's what defines architecture is people that can look at the business requirement, the technical requirement and the operational ongoing, you know, what do we get paid for is to keep this crap running. Um, don't throw stuff that's overcomplicated over the team that's going to manage it. And, and we grade that way. Like, why did you yep. choose that? How did you come up with that path? What justify that? Because, um, this isn't the route just parroting a certain answer. We're, I think we're true to what we say to the market. We use open standard stuff. Um, and OSPF, BGP and ISIs, they're, they're all open standard and they all work. Now we may give you some guidance on why we would, you know, maybe go BGP instead of OSPF. Um, but certainly we got customers that do both. And they they, yeah. they have good reasons for doing it. So we kind of wanted to make sure that that was covered. Um, and then, you know, a lot of people ask us the same thing, like how hard can this really be? So there's part of it is we do it in three separate windows for L7. L6 is, you know, more than a month long process. So you got time to really build that and then you got to do the board. But L7, we do over three eight hour windows. And we do that because there's different sections. There's a, a campus section, there's a data center section, there's an automation section and you chip away at it. We, we've even done the, the pass and fail that way. If you get through one and, and you pass that and you get to the next one and you fail that, well, you don't have to restart over. You just got to come back and, and redo the change window on whatever it is, data center, because you didn't get the data center working by Monday morning. Um, we grade that way. Is it functional or is it not functional? There's no line of points you can get. Does the network work? Um, and, and, you know, by doing that, we let people do it open book. So in some ways we do these three windows and people are like, oh my God, this is going to be ridiculous. How can anybody pass for that long? That's crazy. But then on the other side, it's open book. It's open internet. It's open whatever, because um, I always like making the statement, if you show up to a major data center, you know, change window in some of the Fortune 50 companies that I've worked for, and you show up on Friday afternoon with a smile on your face, that's pretty much grounds to me to just fire you right there on the spot. You're not a good engineer. You know, if you show up with your notebooks all packed up, you got your laptop, you got files saved everywhere, um, you, you're ready to go and you're bringing all this to the table because you know Mr. Murphy is real and he's going to show up at some point during his change window and you want to have resources so you can look things up quickly, then you're a very squared away prepared engineer. And, yeah. and uh, if that's my opinion for real people in real production, why wouldn't I test that way too? Because I think when we test it that way, we actually get to, we get to do operational readiness. You know, we're, we're, we're evaluating whether or not you're the guy ready to, to lead that window. Um, so outside of that, um, any tips, obviously don't give away the goodies, but any Please. tips on studying or, um, approaching it, how serious to approach it, like the amount of time that you've spent, um, just any recommendations that you would give to somebody just watching this, maybe scratching their head going, maybe I'll give this a shot. Yeah. Like for me, I always, I learn by doing stuff. And if it's creating my own virtual topologies at home or, you know, I joke around with the other guys on my team, I've probably got the most complicated home network out there running BGP and verse just because I can, but it's one of those things I did it. So I learned it. And so, yeah, I'd almost say like, as weird as it sounds, been prepping for for the past five years had Arista. Coming before coming to Arista, I knew what VXLAN was, and that was it. EVPN I never heard of. 
but being here, learning about it, being able to incorporate my day to day with customers and then practicing it in my old labs to learn, I was able to hone in on those technologies and protocols to where it better prepared me for these exams, you know, just showing how practical these are. And, you know, going to the three different sessions of the L7, yeah, you're being tested on different areas of the network, but a lot of the same principles and the designs, they all, they fit hand in hand with each other. So it's, it wasn't, I had to worry about, I've got three different scenarios and what am I going to do for each one of them? It's as long as I remember the basics of networking and, you know, what I've learned over my time, you know, I knew I was going to do well with it. So it was a great, you know, accolade to of being able to leverage what I know in the field you know, what I do on a day to day and what these exams are able to accomplish for us. So even saying that, Rob, and as long as, you know, you've been doing this and you do it day in, day out, um, would you call it easy? Would you call it medium or would you call it, 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 it'll kick your butt. I feel like <laughs> it's going to depend. Like, I feel like it's more e getting easier for me because I'm getting more accustomed and used to working with on a day-in-day -day basis. Um, it is a challenge. It is not an easy task to be able to, you know, if you need to configure a data center for eVPN and you have to prepare for it, good luck in reality. Like, because like you said, if you come into your change window that Friday with no notes, no preparing, that's not going to go well. It's you need to put in the effort, the prep work for it all to basically be ready to do it, but have your either notes or just that back-end knowledge of what you've been doing to, you know, well, what, what, do I, what do I need to configure? What am I missing? And, you know, just getting that last refresher about it. So it is definitely challenging. Um, but I feel like it's not, if you prepare yourself and understand what you're trying to accomplish, that it's very, it's very, it's easy to accomplish it. Like you can get through it. Yeah. I, I, I like the way you, I like the way you said that, and, and you know, and for for everybody watching, that's it's it's not just a description. This is actually, you know, the the way we design the the program to work is, um, I w I will say out loud as many times as I can, as publicly as I can. There there is nothing in our expert exams that is not taught in our levels one through five. There there is no secret sauce. There is no magic stuff. There's no corner cases. It's straight down. Most of this stuff is things that we see in just about every customer. So we're not, we're not pulling off the, this one odd customer. We have customers that do that stuff. And, and most of that stuff is not on the exam because it's not typical. It's not, it's not mainstream. Um, I won't go so far as to say it's best practice. Cause I, I think, you know, one thing I like about Arista is we don't use that, that term a lot. Uh, we use recommended practice because you know, is BGP a best practice or is OSP a best practice? Well, we have, we have recommended practices for both which one fit you. So um, everything you need to learn is in those courses. Um, everything that's in the exams has been covered in a lab somewhere in those courses. Um, we have lots of lab time. We do this as standard practice with all of our courses. Um, you know, every course that you take, you're going to get three weeks worth of lab type idea. Um, you know, describing it based on the number of hours, you know, normally you go to a class, you get, you know, maybe 15 out of the 40 hours of that week in a five-day class is, is doing a lab. Usually it's because, you know, you, somebody just taught you something. And then five minutes later, you went and started typing. You have no idea what you're typing, but you got it to work at the end. Congratulations. You did your lab, right? You, you come Monday, you sit down at the keyboard and you're like, I have no idea what I did last week. Right. So we make sure that you have lab time to go ahead and repeat that for a couple more weeks to, to get proficient now. And you can buy more lab time. You can extend that. You can do all kinds of things that we can do. I do that. You can reach out to guys like you to SEs and go, Hey, what, what is the deal? Should I, should I do this or should I do that? We're not going to answer the test for you, but Hey, if you need to understand EVPM, you got a lot of people that know it, right? This is what we do every day. Um, and then my last thing I'll say on that is, you know, the reason, the main reason that I, I didn't, you know, listen in the, in the expert world is this always a matter of, you don't want too many people to pass. You don't want too many people to fail. You want it to be, you know, hard where people chase it so that you can get the best of the best out there. Um, but at the same time, you know, how do you do that? Now, a lot of other programs like to throw these little zingers in the back corner. I remember studying for CCIE the first time back in the nineties. That's 
much as I'll just say. Um, and, you know, it was kind of known then that there was going to be at least something on there. Back then, you could get the entire Cisco website on a CD. It's like the whole thing was a CD. And, you know, all their documentation was on that CD. So there was at least 10% of the exam that you were going to have to look up on that CD during your lab. And they would have it loaded on the machine in the test center because it was something that you have never heard of anywhere else, right? And I can always remember I had like Dow backup, use an ISDN, only the odd numbered IP host and this and that. And I, for 30 some years, I still don't know why I would ever freaking do that. Like it just, you know, it was so off the wall. I mean, I understand why I put it on the exam because, you know, how do you separate the guys that really, really know how to do it normally? You, you test the back door a little bit. I get the logic. But today, I mean, Rob, we got our CVP platform in here. We've got automation, which covers things like Ansible and, you know, very large Ansible and Python type schemas. Um, you've got BGP in here in a way that BGP wasn't even necessarily designed for. Most people learned early on how BGP works. It's not necessarily how it's used in a lease line. Um, and, and, and then, you know, EVP in itself is, is an enormous freaking topic. You've got an, an overlay, an underlay, a data plane, a control plane. Like, there's virtual stuff that doesn't make any sense. Um, I, honestly, I just feel like that's hard enough. If you get all that right, you're you're a pretty damn good engineer, in my opinion. Um, because that's each of those things I've seen over 30-something years that people could build a career around any one of them by themselves. And that's all they know. I mean, I definitely know guys that are BGB guys. That's it. Ask them a switching question, they're dumb as a rock. BGP can tell you things that no human should know, right? Um, so, I mean, to me, the topics themselves created the the, the difficulty level. Um, and you're on the spot. And, and you know you know you got to do this. That's enough. Why, why spend two grand, have a trick question, have to come back and take it four times? And, and meanwhile, you just figure out that I'll just go get a copy of the exam and practice it over and over. Eventually, I'm going to get the same one twice and I'll pass. I, we don't do that. We just say, sit down and configure it. If you get it to work, you pass. It's not it's not complicated. So, well, Rob, I really appreciate you taking the time, man. And uh, and again, congratulations. Uh, no small task. One of the the first uh, the first one hundred to get it. Um, and and all deserving. I've known you for for a bit now since we we kind of been here about the same amount of time. And you do awesome stuff for the company. And uh, and hoping now you know everybody else in the world can see that too. So, congratulations, yeah. my friend. Thank you again, Terry. All right, no problem. Thank you.